Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the house of the Lord. It's great to be here with you today. It's nice to have some warmer weather, and uh, we thank the Lord for His presence that is here with us in this room as you find your seats. We're going to open this time as we gather together with the Lord and just uh, tune our hearts uh, to Him today. I know there are many who are battling all kinds of different physical challenges. I'm so glad that we serve a God who can handle every situation and nothing is too hard for Him. And so as you've come, some of you are here today uh, dealing with some challenges. And I want to remind you that um, the Bible tells us that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. Yes, he does. And I believe that God is able to minister a healing touch to you even while we worship. So don't be surprised if God doesn't show up and do something very special for you that you may have not even expected this morning. Mm -hmm. So as we begin, um, we're going we're gonna to commit this morning to the Lord and ask that he will have his way in every way, in everything that is said and done. And in opening our service, my wife is going to read Psalm chapter 67, verses 1 to 4. Would you lend your ear to the word of the Lord today? May God be merciful and bless us. May his face smile with favor on us. May your ways be known throughout the whole earth, your saving power among the people everywhere. May the nations praise you, O oh God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Let the whole world sing for joy because you govern the nations with justice and guide the people of the whole world. Here we are. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And so let's honor our chief shepherd this morning. Would you join with me in standing together? Yes, and let's commit this time to the Lord. There are many things that can distract you. It's normal. We live busy lives. But for this time, would you put those aside? If you have to write it down on a little notepad, do that and deal with it after service. But let this be a time where God gets your undivided attention and the Lord desires to speak to you today and he desires to minister to you today. Father, we thank you for your presence that is here with us this morning. We welcome you in this place. For everyone who is hurting, you are the healer. For everyone who needs a touch in their emotions, Lord, you are the one who ministers to our emotions today. Lord, for those in this room who are needing direction, you are the one who guides our steps when we seek you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, O oh Lord, for this opportunity that we have to praise and to honor you. And I pray that as Isaac leads us in worship, along with the entire worship team, that this whole congregation would be a choir of praisers, those who lift up and honor your name today. And as our praises rise, may your presence come. And may you move in a special way, Lord, here at Christian Life Center today. We love you, Lord. We seek to impress no one but you. For you are our God. You are the one who formed us in our mother's womb. You are the one to whom we will give an account for every word and every action. We do not need to compare ourselves with anybody else. So we humble ourselves before you and we say, Lord, would you search our hearts today? And if there is anything there that would displease you, would you reveal it so that we can become more and more like you? I pray your blessing on every man and woman, boy and girl in this place. And I pray, Lord, that you would show up in a mighty way today. And as we worship you, may you be pleased with what you hear today. We love you and we honor you. For you are a mighty and awesome God. Oh, Jesus. You are welcome in this place. And we worship you today. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people say, amen. Would you begin by praising the Lord with your hands? Our God is worthy to be magnified above every problem, every circumstance. We honor our God today. Hallelujah. God bless you, church. Hallelujah. God bless you more. Praise. How many are free in Jesus this morning? Amen. Thank you, Lord. I know there's a lot of people in this world that they have addictions that, that I can personally testify of 
of addictions that I have been taken out of by the blood of Jesus. But I just ask that all those who are those blood-bought believers that are free in Jesus' name, that we celebrate the Lord this morning. We celebrate that freedom. Amen? Amen. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Clap a little louder than before. I want to sing a little louder than before. Oh, 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 oh. I want to jump higher than before. I want to shout louder than before. Now everybody say freedom. I want to clap a little louder than before. I want to sing a little louder than before. Oh, 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 oh. I want to spin wilder than before. Said I want to shout louder than before. Now everybody sing freedom. Oh, oh, oh. Freedom, freedom, said one more time to freedom, 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 free, freedom, freedom. I wanna lift my hands higher than before. I want to love you more than before I want to worship deeper than before Said I want to scream louder than before Now everybody sing freedom yeah. We're free in you Jesus shackles no more chains no more bondage i am free yeah. no more shackles no more chains no more bondage i am free yeah. how many can sing that this morning said no more shackles sing your thing no more chains, no more bondage, I am free, yeah. And if you believe it, sing with me, hallelujah, 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 freedom. No more shackles, no more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Believe we'll it over your family that no more shackles, no, 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 no. No more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Sing no more shackles, no more shackles. Say. Shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Now let's sing hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
we're free in you, Jesus. Sing one more time to freedom. We're free in you, Jesus. Jesus that we're free in you that we're no longer bound to sin in the name of Jesus that we're set free the name of Jesus we were bought with a price of blood in the name of Jesus and that price has set us free hallelujah thank you Jesus hallelujah thank you Jesus our whole destiny has been changed in the name of Jesus we are set free in you Jesus thank you Lord Jesus you are the great I am we love you Lord Yeah, 
God Almighty, the great I am. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Holy, holy God Almighty, the great I am. Who is worthy? None beside thee, God Almighty. The mountains, the mountains shake before him, the demons run and flee. At the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell, nor any who can sing before the power and the presence of the great I am, great I am. Great I am, the great I am, the great I am, the great I am. Said hallelujah, holy, holy God Almighty, the great. shake before you Lord and demons run and flee at the name of you Jesus on his unchanging grace I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my 
my anger holds within the veil. My anger holds within the veil. Christ alone, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak and made strong in the Savior's love. Through Lord of all, in Christ alone, Christ alone, to corner soul, we can make strong, Savior's love. shall come with trumpet sound oh may I then in him be found in his righteousness alone unless you stand before Christ alone, Christ alone, we can be strong, you Jesus for being the cornerstone Jesus that without you Jesus we would not be put together father we would be a broken mess Jesus but we thank you for being the cornerstone of our lives Jesus oh Jesus let us stand only alone in you Jesus not in our strength Jesus but stand in you Jesus So that when the whole structure is complete, that everything is in proper order. The enemy is constantly trying to get us to measure our lives by something other than the cornerstone. But I pray today that we will tune out the voices of the world that constantly try to tell us that we are less than or not enough based upon the standards of the world. I pray that every person in this room this morning will understand how incredibly valuable and precious they are and that they are a part of the building that you are creating for we together are your temple how amazing it is that you who could choose to dwell wherever you want chose to come and to live inside of us individually 
but then also corporately. You chose to be present in a special way when we gather together. And here we are. And here you are. And we honor you today. Oh Lord, we thank you that through the twists and the turns of life, through the valleys and the mountains, your steadfast love remains the same. Your faithfulness was fresh and new this morning, just as it was yesterday morning, and it will be tomorrow. I'm so glad that no matter what we're going through, that we can count on you, that we can lean on the everlasting arms of our wonderful Heavenly Father. Remind us, Lord, when we begin to forget, remind us of your faithfulness and help us to do our best to remind ourselves of how good you are. We love you and we thank you that every good and precious gift comes from you, the Father of lights, with whom is no changing or shadow of turning. You have good things in store for your people. We thank you for that. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We serve a good God. Before you sit this morning, would you find at least two people that you haven't spoken to in two weeks? And let them know how glad you are to see them in the house of the Lord today. So today I'd like to share with you from uh, Philemon chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. It states, you are, generous, you are generous because of your faith, and I am praying that you will really put your generosity to work, for in doing so, you will come to an understanding of all the good things we can do for Christ. I myself have gained much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because your kindness has so often refreshed the hearts of God's people. You see, your pursuit of God in a generous life will give you a fuller and richer life. We need to remember that first things belong to God. The first, first day of the week belongs to God. The first hour of the day belongs to God. The first portion of your income belongs to God. And when you make God first, he can help you. Amen? Ushers, if you can come forward. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord God, we are so grateful, Lord. Grateful for everything that you have blessed us with, Father. And we thank you for in advance for everything that is to come, Father. Lord, we ask for your hand upon these offerings, Lord God. Father, continue to multiply them. Continue to give us the wisdom, Lord Father, to use them to do good works in your name, Lord. We thank you, we praise you, and we commit everything to you. In your name we pray. Amen. I love the Word of God. I remember a time when I was required to read the Word of God. I was required to memorize the Word of God. And it was a duty. It was an expectation. I didn't always enjoy it. It was something that was a a chore, a task, and uh, and then I came to know the author. Things changed because I understood that there was purpose. I understood that God had a, un, had a had a reason for what He said, and that He didn't intend for me just to read it. He didn't intend for me just to memorize it. He intended it to come alive in me and to be like rivers of living water. And uh, the more and more that I get to read it now, and I look at it differently than I did before, the more that I get to read it now, the more I see the treasures that are hidden for those who seek, they will find. And I'm grateful as I read the Word of God. Each day, God opens up different nuggets to me, and I'm so thankful for his word. I want to challenge each one of you to continue to read the word of God daily. It's very important for your life, not just as a sense of duty, and maybe you, maybe you are trying to establish a habit, so you're kind of making it a duty, but I want you to look at it in such a way to where you allow God to speak to you every day. 
After all, he made you. He knows you best. And he knows what will work well. And so it's worth it to take the time to listen to his voice. So read your Bible every day. And spend time with the one who loves you more than anything else. This morning, I want to share with you something that I believe is very critical for all of us. And uh, it's a reminder, but it's also uh, something that the Lord, I believe, wants us to live our lives by. And that is that God loves every single person on this planet more than anything. Particularly, God loves people more than anything. How about you? And I want to talk to you a little bit about that this morning because it's God's heart. When we pray the prayer that many of you have memorized, where Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray, he wasn't exactly telling them to repeat that prayer over and over, but he was teaching them how to pray. And part of that prayer was, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For that to be a reality, you and I have to be on board with the things that matter most to God. The truth is, is that as followers of Jesus Christ, it is possible for you and I to get involved in things that can keep us very busy, that can potentially be outside of the priorities of our Heavenly Father. And when that happens, no matter how much we get accomplished, no matter how many little boxes that we can check and say, did that, I did that. It won't be in line with the will of our Heavenly Father. And so it's very important that you and I understand what matters to God because one day we are going to stand before Him. I look forward to that day. Now, I understand that it's going to be an incredible day. And I probably don't realize what my reaction is fully going to be. But with my heart, I look forward to that day because I know that I was redeemed by him and because he values me. And the truth be told, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for him. And so to me or, and to, to God, I was important. Not because I was important initially, but because he invested in me. Because he gave everything for me. So I want to share some things with you this morning that will affect every part of how we handle life. And these are the thoughts that the Lord, I believe, put in my heart to share with you from his word as it relates to our lives. Number one is, is that people matter more than money. This is very important. People matter more than money. So, uh, I... This, this plays out in the real world, and those who have grabbed a hold of this have succeeded. Succeeded on a level that goes beyond money. Now, there are those who have succeeded in the eyes of the world, but have failed in the eyes of God. Did you know that's possible? And I want to talk to you about that this morning and so for a company, for example, their most important asset are their employees. For a marriage, your most important priority is your spouse. For a church, the most valuable component is each person made in the image of God and bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I have often thought of the reality that all of the wonderful property that we have here, and these beautiful buildings that we have, if they were to be gone, how would we function? My prayer and my heart's desire is that Christian life center will be more than the property on which we meet. 
that Christian life center will be more than this wonderful sanctuary that God has given us. And that if through some turn of events, neither of these were present, that we would still be a fully functioning church for the glory of God. Because we are united, not by the property or by the building, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. People are more important than buildings. People are more important than the church's finances or the value of its tangible material assets. People, individual people, are more important than the size of the congregation. The Lord has reminded me of this often. It's very important that God's people be cared for well. And sometimes there is this temptation to pursue the amount of people and forget the importance of the care of each individual. And the truth be told is that there are situations where it is counterproductive to have an overly large group. Those situations are where the, the sheep are not able to be adequately cared for. I'm reminded often that when Jesus fed the thousands, which by the way, they were only counting the men in those numbers. It specifically stated that. So there could have been triple the amounts. The 5,000 could have been 15,000. When Jesus fed them, he divided them up into manageable groups. Do you remember that? Who remembers how many were in the groups? 50, correct. He divided them up into groups of 50 so that they would be manageable. Now, God can handle anything. He can handle a group of 15,000. But he broke it down. It's very important that we take good care of what God has provided for us. The same principle applies. He who is faithful with a little will be faithful with much. And sometimes we can look at wanting more and we aren't focused on doing our best with what we have. And I tell you, the Lord is the one who gives more. The Lord is the one who expands our borders. The Lord is the one who increases influence. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. That's all. God is able to do more than we can ask or think. But unless you have a fully functioning structure that is going to support the proper care for a larger group, then it's counterproductive. If you've ever been in a situation where you're planning for something small, and all of a sudden you get double, you know, that, you know the stress that happens. You need more of this, more of that. You need more people to help. You need all of these different things. And so what I have seen is, is that the Lord has such a wonderful way of growing things. And you see it in the plant world. You see these massive trees that grow, particularly out in the Northwest. If you've ever had the opportunity to go out in the Northwest, and see some of these massive, gigantic trees, it is phenomenal. These are giants that tower so high that it blocks the sun from the uh, forest uh, area. And yet those trees grew from a very small seed that you could hold in your hand. Inside of that seed was the DNA of that giant tree and it didn't all happen overnight. But slowly but surely it grew and became what God had placed into the DNA of that seed. And this is what I believe. As we honor God with our priorities, His DNA is able to be manifested in what He puts together. 
so that we will be able to grow strong as well as large for his glory because we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. I try to remember this and I try to say it often. I am an under shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. He is the one to whom all of us owe our lives. I get the privilege of being able to assist in sharing his word with you on a regular basis. But he's the one who died for you. And he is the one who loves you more than me. I'm learning to love you more and more. But he loves you the most. And he gave everything for you. And the message that I want to communicate to you today is that you are valuable to God. And because you are valuable to God, he expects you as his child to think the same way of other people. If you are going to be a man or a woman who is growing in the image of God, you are also going to need to grow in how you value people. Another challenge is, whenever you're growing anything, for those of you in large families and grew up in large families, I know nowadays uh, generally don't have as large of families as we did before. I remember my, my father came from a family of 13, and uh, I know that there were many large families, particularly those growing up on a farm. It was very advantageous to have the kids working and taking care of, of the farm, and so it really lent itself to having large families. Uh, nowadays, uh, at least from my limited perspective, it seems a lot less than before. But when you're, when you're dealing with uh, any large group, with that large group, you always have the potential for those who are sick or weak or slow you down. It's just a reality. God looks at our hearts to see how we handle those who are weak, those who are sick, and those who slow us down. This is very important. Now, by the measurement of the world... The world says, you aren't valuable to me because you're not making me any money. Therefore, I'm going to try to minimize my losses and do whatever I can to make things work, to keep the bottom line as a priority. But God looks at you differently. This is really important. And this is where you and I have to think differently than the world. Now, I'm not saying that every company uh, makes those kinds of decisions that way. But in general, a company exists to make money. But God wants you and me to make decisions differently. So now, when we come across those who would slow us down, how are we to deal with that? Because in our human nature, we're not long-suffering. That's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. In our human nature, we want to keep moving. And why are you slowing me down? Okay, you're sick. I'm sorry you're sick, but could you get better quickly? Because we got to get going. That's our human nature. You know, and like it, and, and, and truth be told, we may like to, to think that we are totally compassionate, that it never bothers us when things don't go the way we expect. But that's a work of the Holy Spirit that has to work in our lives to value somebody when they're slowing us down. I have seen this happen over and over, particularly in families and sometimes in marriages. And there have been situations in family members connected to me where it has cost the marriage because of an illness. God's heart breaks. God's heart breaks. God wants you and me to be willing to deal with those who are going through a challenge in a way that honors him. So how does God handle it? God says in his word that when one member of the body suffers, we all suffer. 
There are things that God does in our lives when we're moving slowly that can only be done at a slow speed. And sometimes when we want to go fast and we feel like someone's slowing us down, we don't realize that God is doing something that is necessary at that slower pace, and we need to not try to push the gas. We need to be able to say, Lord, what are you doing during this slow season of my life? Because the most important thing is the person that you're dealing with, not the goal that you're trying to achieve. And if in your heart that person ends up feeling like they're in the way of the goal you're trying to achieve, then in your heart their value will go down and the value of the goal is going to go up and all you're going to be thinking about is, is how long do I have to put up with this situation that is standing in the way between me and what I'm really trying to accomplish? But what God wants us to do is to understand that the goal is actually the person that is in front of us. The goal is actually the person for whom he died. And any amount of work or project or accomplishment or finances, all of that is secondary to the most valuable thing that God has on planet earth. People. Everything on this planet will be destroyed one day, according to the Apostle Peter. Destroyed by fire. But every soul that is represented in this congregation today, the Bible says that eternity has been set in your heart by your Creator, the Almighty God. And your soul will last forever. And that's why the gospel message is so important to be preached, because either way, whether in the presence of the Lord or in the fires of hell, one way or another, our soul will spend eternity somewhere. And when God looks down on this earth, he's not all that interested in how many buildings are being built. He's not all that interested in how the company's doing. And I'm saying that generally now because God can involve himself in the financial affairs of men. Absolutely. Please don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that when it comes to a bottom line, whatever God's tracking, it involves people. And God is willing to slow down to deal with you. And he won't roll you over to just get something done. And if he won't do that, then we can't do that either. That if something comes our way that slows us down, we need to say, Lord, what are you doing in the middle of this? And what do you want me to do? And we need to be willing to put on the brakes. Many of you know the story of the Good Samaritan quite well. The first two who passed by the Samaritan had stuff to do. It was not easy for them. They didn't have the time. Their goal was to get something accomplished. And so they see someone at the side of the road who's hurting and in pain and weak, not able to help themselves. And for that, those two people that pass by, they said, uh, that's not in line with my goal. Um, I'm sorry that person just got jumped. I'm sorry he got beat up and he's lying bloody by the side of the road. But I've got stuff to do. I'm really busy. I mean, if he would have got injured yesterday, I might have had some time. But today, I mean, I've got everything is booked solid today. And what happens is, is that in our busy life, especially here in the United States, and I've had the privilege to travel through many countries, is that we are so time-driven and we are so goal-oriented that it's very difficult for us at times to slow down the pace. Because we feel like we're on a treadmill and that we don't have control over the speed of the treadmill. We feel like, well, my job requires this, my boss requires this, my family requires this. And so you're just kind of like going with it, going with it. But you and I need to assess our lives 
Because there are key times in our lives, and not every moment is the same, but there are key times in our lives where your decisions will affect the treadmill you step onto. And that treadmill will affect what happens down the road. And it's very important that you understand that the choices that you make to value people will determine the ultimate success of your life. You could potentially run a company where you made a lot of money, but all of that would not speak very much of you if you had stepped over plenty of people to get there. God values people more than anything, and he expects us to do the same. We, as the body of Christ, are called to put aside the things that are calling for our attention immediately to say, come on, we got to get moving, we got to get going. And God wants us to take a pause and say, no, but I want you to stop. I want you to talk. I want you to pray. I want you to minister to this person. Because that is my priority right now. If I were walking on earth, I would not pass that person by. And this applies not only in the congregation of the saints, but also as we see people that are hurting. Not every opportunity will be the same, but there are those opportunities where you get into conversations who do not know God. Why not take the opportunity to say, hey, can I pray for you today? I'd like to help you. God wants to help you. Our presentation of the gospel should be one that is not only verbal, but also in action. And there are some that seem to take it to both extremes. That some it's only words. And then others it's only actions. And God didn't intend for it to be either or. It's a whole package deal. Because the whole body, God intended for the whole body to be involved in the message that is being proclaimed. That's why the word of God says that they, the unbelievers, will know that you are my followers, Christians. Why? Because you love one another. They'll see that you are prioritizing one another, that you are caring for one another. And one of the things the Word of God says is that we are to care for one another even as a priority over the world. In other words, if we can't love each other, how are we going to love someone that we don't really know? You don't know their name. You don't sit with them in church. That's a little farther of a leap. Start with the person who sits next to you. Start with the person in your own fellowship and allow the love of God to flow through you. And then you get some training and you get to be able to practice the love of God in action so that now when you're talking face to face with a stranger at Cumberland Farms, the Holy Spirit will be there and say, you know what? You can take a moment right now and say, I'd be glad to pray for you. Your back hurting. I'll be glad because God is able to heal you. It won't be such a far step because you've already done it with the person who was next to you in church. And the same thing happened during meet and greet. And I saw a group of people over here who were gathered together in prayer with Linda Alston, who's going through a great challenge. God cares about people more than anything. May it not be that we gather together and we just have a little bit of stuff that happens and then we leave without understanding that God cares more about people than anything else. People matter more than money. People matter more, listen closely, than your financial investments. The Bible says that we are to cast our bread on the waters and it will come back to us. And in reference, it's talking about giving to those who are in need. Your investment with those who are in need is more important than your investment in your financial institutions. Because God says, I am the one who runs the bank, and I'll take care of paying you back well. I will guide you, I will direct you, and whatever you invest in my people, I will pay you back. God cares about people, and when you care about people, you watch and see, because he cares about you, he'll go out of his way to take care of your needs unexpectedly. Listen to this verse, Proverbs 19, 17. If you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord, and he will. This is the promise of the Lord now. Listen closely. And he will. He doesn't say maybe. He might get around to it, but he will repay you. 
He will repay you. There's another proverb that says that the borrower is a servant to the lender. Now, the Lord is never our servant. But do you see here that when we are honoring the things that God honors, God then commits himself to follow through on repaying us for what we do. Now, some of you may have done acts of kindness and even uh, investing in people, and no one knows about it. No one knows. That's exactly the way it's supposed to be. You don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. That's what Jesus said, didn't he? You don't need anybody to go, oh, good job. You went and you gave this money to that person and you helped. That's Why do they need to know? You're not lending to them. You're lending to the Lord. You hand someone a blessing that the Lord puts in your heart. This is, this is what you just did. You just lended to the Lord. That's what you did. You just lent money to the Lord. Do you think God owes anybody anything? The scripture says, owe no man anything but to love one another. God is never going to remain in debt to you. So guess what? He is going to fulfill his word, and he will repay you. He will. Now, we don't do good deeds just to get payment from the Lord, but I'm just telling you, this is a principle from God's word. So that when you're doing the things God asks you to do, you're not thinking, man, I'm just running out. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Understand what you're doing because you're investing and you're lending to the Lord. This is, this is an amazing story in Mark chapter 10, verse 17. And this is the next point I want to make. First of all, I mentioned Peter, people matter more than your financial investments. Uh, this is people matter more than your financial savings. Now, in, in the olden days, it wasn't so much that uh, the people had a lot of cash sitting around. But what made a person rich, and you'll see this in the stories of Lot, who was a very rich man. You'll see this in the story of Abraham, who was also a very rich man. The Bible says that they had a lot. They were either farmers, and they had a lot of, of, um, of uh, good crop, or they had a lot of animals. And this determined a a lot about their financial level. So people matter more than your financial savings. Now, uh, in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, it says this, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running to him, knelt down and said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 18, Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. Now, what do you think Jesus was saying there? Now, notice, Jesus did not say, I'm not good. He didn't say that. He said, why do you call me good? Because he said, then only God is truly good. Now, he knew, Jesus knew, that he was the Son of God, that he was God. But this person asking him the question, did he know it? So Jesus is trying to help this man connect the dots. Verse 19, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not falsely testify. You must not cheat anyone and honor your father and mother. Okay. Verse 20, teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. I I've done that. I got that covered, Lord. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Notice, Jesus cared about this man. This is very important. Whenever you're dealing with someone, even when they've got their priorities wrong, God loves them, and so should you. And we're going to look at a man here who had his priorities wrong, but Jesus still loved him. Keep that in mind, because sometimes people can frustrate you, and they have their priorities out of whack, and you're like, man, I can't believe their priorities are out of whack. I don't even want to deal with them. God says, I'm willing to deal. 
we're going to deal with this systematically, and I'm going to share the heart of my father, but I still love this person. Can you imagine if God gave up on us every time our priorities were out of line? None of us would be here. So we need to be patient with other people when their priorities are out of line. All right, so he says, Jesus, so Jesus feels this genuine love. And then he says this, there's still one thing, one thing you haven't done. Go and sell all your possessions and lend your money to my dad. I added that, but it's from the other part. It says, go sell all your possessions and give your money to the poor. We just read what happens when you do that. Then, Jesus, this is Jesus who knows what he's talking about. Then he says, you will have treasure in heaven. This is the only thing I'm asking of you. You've apparently kept all the commandments. Just this one thing, he says. Just, that's just little thing. Little thing, go sell everything. Then come follow me. And you'll have treasure in heaven. At this one thing, the man's face fell. And he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Now, as you see what's going on here, what do you think was most important to him? His possessions. The one thing Jesus said, go, do what I've asked you to do. Now, I believe this. I believe that over the years, that man had multiple opportunities to do what Jesus was telling him to do that day. This wasn't anything new. He'd see someone in need. Oh, no, I gotta, gotta remember my bank account. Nope, nope. You hope, hope all goes well. Just take care of yourself, you know. Be warm, well fed. Another day comes by. Man, I don't, don't know if I have enough for you. I, I'm really saving up for the future. I want to make sure I've got enough for retirement. And I've got to make sure that everything is going to go well for me. I have no doubt that God provided many opportunities for this person to do what he was asking him to do on that day. But he had turned God down each time. And now at this occasion, Jesus was kind of putting his finger on that issue again, but now very clearly saying it's time you're either going to make a decision to follow me or you're going to decide not to follow me. And it's clear what he decided. His face went down, and I wonder what was running through his mind. I'm just going to surmise for a moment. My possessions, what did he just say? This, I know this teacher. He is good. Like he, Everything he says is good. But wait, did he just say sell all your possessions? I can't do that. I've never been able to do that. I mean, I just remember last month I, I, I saw that person. They were in great need. But I know that's my possessions. I earned that stuff. I need that stuff. What he had done without probably noting it, he probably wouldn't have written on a paper, I value possessions more than people. He probably wouldn't have written that down, but that's exactly what was happening in his heart. And God knew it. And so that's the reason why God asked him, sell everything. Now, that doesn't mean that God is asking everyone in this room, go sell everything. I remember I had... I, I was growing in the Lord. I had rededicated my life to the Lord, and I read through this passage, and I thought, oh, Lord, are you asking me to do that? Do I need to sell my car? Do I need to just, like, get rid of everything and make sure that I'm making you happy today? And the Lord revealed to me that not necessarily did I need to do that, but I needed to be willing to do that if needed. 
that the possessions wasn't the issue. I'm glad for my house I have. I'm glad for my car, two cars. They're older cars, but they're cars. I thank God for them. I thank God for the stuff I have in my house. But that becomes a problem for me, and it becomes a problem for you if your possessions or your money end up becoming your priority. And the evidence of that is, is that when you're dealing with a person and your possessions are called into question, you get defensive. Wait, that's my possession. You don't expect me to give that up for you, do you? And so Jesus, who was a person, put it all on the line. He says, are you willing to come follow me or are you willing to follow your possessions? And this is what the man decided. His face fell. He went away sad for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This amazed them. But Jesus said again, dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. little explanation on that. And whether this is 100% or not, I'm not fully sure. But there's, there's a place in Jerusalem. It's called... It's an eye of a needle, and it's really a small entrance. It's not a needle with a little eye hole through it. It's a place where you could go through, but it's not a regular gate. It's a really small one. And when you come to the city and you've got your camel, which they would have been using, packed with stuff. And for that camel to get through, everything on the camel had to be unloaded. Then the camel had to get on his knees because he wouldn't fit through standing up. And he'd have to be kind of prodded and pushed through this entrance, which is an eye of a needle. It's called an eye of a needle. And then he'd have to stand the camel back up, bring all the stuff through, and put all the stuff back on the camel. And then you go on your way. It was very inconvenient. Jesus was saying, from what I understand in the cultural context, that that task was easier than for a rich man to enter in. In other words, a rich man has to work extra hard to stay focused on people being a priority. That's what I believe Jesus was saying. A rich man not has to work to get into heaven. I'm not saying that. But a rich man has to work extra hard to keep focused on the reality that people are most important. Because there are many rich people in this world who are selfish. Doesn't mean all rich people are selfish. That's why Jesus said, with God, nothing is impossible, right? So that does, Jesus didn't rule out rich people. In fact, in the scriptures, it says, charge those who are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives to us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the life to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. That's God's charge through his word to rich people. But here's the problem. When it comes to a choice between possessions or riches and people, God expects you and I to always say people come first. People come first. And the reason I share this with you is because it affects you as a, as a child of God. It affects you as a servant of God. But it also affects your family. It affects your children. It affects the jobs you choose. It's not always easy because we live in a world that is not driven by focus on people. Now, I will say that there are some companies who have got it right, who have valued their employees, and God has blessed them for it. 
and they have ended up financially succeeding because they weren't pursuing money first, but they were honoring God and they were respecting and honoring people. I think of that often, even in the, the staff I have here at the church, so blessed to be able to have those who work here. Judy Kurzik, my wife, Heidi, Marcio, John Kurzik is as if he works here. He's here so much as a blessing and volunteering all the time. But the staff, I think often, God, may I honor you by honoring them in how I handle them, in how they are dealt with financially, pressure-wise, expectations, all of those things. I'll give an account to God for that. Every one of you who own businesses, make sure you're honoring the Lord and how you deal with people. And for those of you who may be stuck in a job where the most important thing is money, don't be surprised if you're not going to be constantly under pressure to change your priorities to fit the needs or the wants of that company. How do you deal with that? It's not easy. Because the Bible says we're in the world, but not of it. Doesn't mean you can always get out of that situation. But the Apostle Paul said this. He says, if the opportunity arises for you to come out from under that pressure, take it. Be careful that you yourself don't respond to the carrot at the end of the stick dangling a higher paying job. For you to stay in a place that prioritizes money over everything else. You may be benefiting in the short term, but not the long term. It will cost you in your family. It will cost you in your health. It will cost you in your priorities. Now, again, I'm not saying you can always get out of these situations, but when you are in the opportunity of making a choice, especially when you're in the uh, opportunity of getting another job, choose wisely. Because your commitment involves more than just doing what you do and getting a paycheck. Look at the heart of the company. Because that heart of the company is going to affect you on an everyday uh, uh, part of your life. People are more important than your financial future. Listen to these words going on down in Mark. The disciples uh, were astounded, and then they asked this question in verse 26 of Mark chapter 10. Then who in the world can be saved? Think about that. This conversation led them to coming to the point of saying, are you serious? Then who can be saved? Obviously, Jesus was dealing with possessions in a much broader sense than just a certain level of richness. There are poor people who can be stingy just as there are rich people who are stingy. Just because a person doesn't have money doesn't mean that they don't love money. And we have to be careful of that. The fact that a person has money does not mean automatically that they're selfish, but neither does it mean that a poor person isn't selfish. God's looking at the heart, and God expects us to be generous. So whatever you have, it's irrelevant. It all came from God anyways. You may have worked for it. You may have gotten an education. You may be getting a certain level amount in your paycheck, but I'm just here to remind you this morning that all of that came from the hand of your heavenly father without favoritism I might add so don't think you're better than anybody else because you've got a little bit more than somebody else remember that God blesses you so that you can bless others God expects us to have a generous spirit Jesus responded in verse 27, and he looked at them. I love how it says this word, intently. You ever looked at someone intently before? Now, this wasn't just an off-the-cuff thing. He's like, you hear me now. I'm talking to you. 
And he says, as he's looking at them intently, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. Then Peter began to speak up, as he often did. And Peter said, we've given up everything to follow you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus replied, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property along with persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be least important then, and those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. Don't be fooled by what the world says about people. Last point, people matter more than popularity. We are living in a day and age where social media is sucking the compassion out of people's hearts. It is literally vacuuming the compassion out of people's hearts. Before social media even became strong, I remember when Facebook just came out, I, I was one of the first ones to, to get on it. And I have a Facebook account. But over the years, one of the things I've determined is that unless I'm certain that what I communicate can be very clearly understood, I don't put anything out there. Because so much of what we communicate is nonverbal communication. You may see what I'm saying here, and we can talk together. But once I start typing, especially if I do a typo, and one sentence can say the exact opposite of what you intend, everything can go haywire. Tone of voice, you don't get any of that. The heart, how is the heart conveyed? Through the communication that is not seen. When Jesus looked intently, that wouldn't have worked on Facebook. Couldn't have shown that visual. People matter more than popularity. People are more important than your likes, your subscriptions, and your views. There are many things that I have said, Lord, give me wisdom in how to respond to this matter. And I'm going to tell you, friends, we need more one-on-one -on -one communication and less of these blasts that don't properly communicate. So please, I, as your pastor, I challenge you, be cautious, be wise. The Bible says be slow to speak and be quick to listen. And I would add to that, be slow to post. Use wisdom. And when you're sharing what someone else said, keep this in mind, it's as if you said it. I remember talking to someone about something they shared. Oh, I didn't exactly say that. That was the person. But you shared it. You own what you share. And particularly just to share in leadership, and if you're a member here at this church, what you post and what you share, you represent Christian Life Center. So I lovingly ask you, use wisdom. And if you're fighting a battle, take it offline. You may need to fight some battles. Just take them offline. It's a lot better and easier that way. Let the Lord guide you in how you handle when you're dealing with people, you need to deal with them in a way that values them. People are more important also than your sphere of influence. There's a lot of discussion about what leadership is, and I've heard a lot of comments about different definitions of leadership, and one of them is the ability to influence people. 
okay. But people are more important than your sphere of influence. And the Lord has reminded me of that often. As a pastor, I get torn many times after service, various people talking to situations and stuff brewing that you don't always know what's going on. There's some broken situations. God is working. God is mending. God is fixing. But I have to be careful as pastor that when I'm engaged in a conversation that my heart and my mind isn't elsewhere. And that, I'll be honest with you, is something that I constantly have to make sure of. Because there can be 10 things that I'm aware of that are going on in the congregation. And it's not easy when I'm trying to talk to one person and I'm thinking, what about that person? Do I need to address that? Do I need to talk to them? All of those things. I am just being open with you as your pastor have to constantly process that. And I do my best, but I want to get better at it. Is that when I'm talking to you face to face, that I'm actually present in that conversation. And we need to do that with each other. Because, as you know, life is life, and you have a lot going on. But let our, hello, how are you doing, not be something we say because we memorize that, and then we're just like going on to the next person. And the more that we can value people, the more that God will help us to be a tight-knit body. He's the head, we're the body. So these are some things that the Lord has really put in my heart for us as a church body the people are more important than money. People are more important in their popular, than, than your popularity. In fact, the truth be told, there were times Jesus avoided getting out in the crowds because he knew that what he would gain from it would be nothing that was in line with his ultimate goal. His brothers, his family actually said to him, let's go to the feast. You can show yourself off. Like, you can do good stuff. So why don't you go and let's, let's just kind of make this a, a show on the road. Let's make this public. And Jesus said, it's not my time. He said, I'm not going. I'm not going. He didn't add this, but this is what it was. I'm not going with you. Because I'm not going to do what you want to do. I'm not going there for that. And then it says when his family left... He got his stuff together and he went. Why? Because he was going to do it on his own time and his own terms. Don't be bothered if no one's noticing the ministry God's given you. Because the preparation time is very critical for what God's going to do. Allow that time to be time between you and God because when you do become known by others, it's a lot harder. It is. The pressure is a lot greater. And sometimes all we think of is the accolades. Oh, if people know me, then I'll have this and that. The Bible says, as gold is tested by fire, so a man is tested by praise. You have no idea the pressure that comes on some of these popular people. And that's why so many of them crumble. They're on drugs. They're addicted to this and that and the other. Why? Because what they thought would fulfill them doesn't. And someone just, you know, thinking you're the world doesn't actually make you the world. And you're crumbling inside. And you need someone that can make you whole. The only one who can do that is Jesus. Would you close yourself in with the Lord for a moment? I never take for granted that because you're in church today, that your name is written in the book of life. You can be in church but not be ready for heaven. So you might say, well, how can I make sure that I'm ready to see Jesus? The Bible says that with our mouth we confess and with our heart we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. It's simple, but it does take a commitment. Jesus said that we are to count the cost. Following Jesus doesn't always make things easy. In fact, as we just read, God blesses us. He repays us for what we do, but it comes with persecution. Maybe you're here today, and you know that your life is heading in the wrong direction. 
God says to you, I love you, I value you, and I'm willing to help you change course. And his offer to you today is, is if you reach out your hand to him and you say, Father, I need your help. I'm stumbling, I'm falling, and I, I just can't seem to get it together. I surrender all my efforts to you. And I also understand that my sin can only be paid for by the blood of your son. You see, friends, your goodness will never make up for your bad things. Because you do not have a sacrifice good enough to offer to God. Jesus was the only perfect sacrifice that was sacrificed once and for all for you. If you're here today and you would say, Pastor, I want to make that decision to follow Jesus, to surrender my life, to ask him to forgive me of all of my sins and to write my name in the book of life, then I'm going to ask you to take a step this morning to simply stand to your feet right where you are, and I would be so blessed to pray with you. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will be deposited into you, the same Holy Spirit that gives joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness and faithfulness, love. If you're here today and that's you, this is your invitation. I invite you to simply stand to your feet and I'd be glad to pray with you for your name to be written in the book of life. Is there anyone? Don't rush past this point because it's why Jesus died. So unashamedly, I ask again, is there anyone here today who hears the voice of God calling? And you're saying, yes, Lord, I'll respond. I sincerely hope from the bottom of my heart that every person in this room is ready to meet Jesus. As you remain in an attitude of focus on the Lord who gave his life for you, we're going to share communion together. I'm going to ask if those who will be sharing communion this morning could please come up front. As they come, I want to ask you today, as a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have committed your life to follow Christ and you cannot live at odds with your brother or sister, if you truly value people as God does, then God wants you to make things right. There have been words that you have spoken or things that you have done who have, that have dishonored others who are made in the image of God, then God wants you to make that right. Maybe that person is even in church today and you could take care of that today. You're welcome to do so. But before you share communion, anything the Holy Spirit has revealed to you, commit it to God. Say, Lord, in that area, I ask for your forgiveness. Please cleanse me and wash me and make me clean. So during this time now where communion is going to be distributed, now I want you to Take this moment to focus on the Lord and allow the Holy Spirit to do a personal cleansing and a work in you so that when we do share communion together, there will be no barriers, no, nothing blocking the work of the Spirit of the living God in your life. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. I trust that you've had time to communicate with the Lord this morning. What we're doing is something that is personal, but it is also corporate because we together are the body of Christ. As his back was receiving the lashes, as his body was being bruised, it was symbolic of us as the body that he was paying for. The blood that was flowing was flowing for your sake and for mine, not for his. You and I today get to reap the benefits and the rewards of all that Jesus paid for. Word of God tells us 
that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. Would you take that representative of the body of Christ and would you break it? And let us take a moment to thank Jesus for his body that was bruised in our place. Jesus, this never gets old. But like fresh manna that was provided for the Israelites, even though your sacrifice was done once and for all, yet we remember it regularly. And on this Sunday, we are reminded of what you did so that we could even be here. Jesus, thank you for paying the price for all of our sin and for the healing of our bodies. And I pray right now for those in this room who are not feeling well. In the authority of the name of Jesus and by the precious blood that was shed for the healing of our bodies, as we partake, may healing be ministered to the physical bodies in this room today. May those who are dealing with pain, may those who are dealing with any infection, may those who are dealing with something that may be ongoing, may they receive complete healing for the glory of God. Now, Lord, as we share this together, we thank you, we honor you, and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat together. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible tells us, there was no forgiveness of sin. This is why the Old Testament sacrifices were necessary, though they did not completely take care of sin. They were a foreshadowing of what was to come, and that's why Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sins of the world. And you and I are recipients of that redemption. Jesus, thank you for your blood. We celebrate what you have provided. We know that it costs you everything and you were willing to lay it all down because you valued people. You, and you valued us more than anything else. And oh, how we slow you down sometimes. Oh, how we can be rebellious sometimes. Oh, how we can avoid you at times. And yet you persistently pursue us. We owe you such a debt of gratitude. And this morning we say thank you for not giving up. Even though we have been sick and weak. You took the time to minister healing to our wounds. And for that, we thank you. And we love you. And we want to show that love to others who may be sick and weak and may seem to slow us down. Jesus, teach us to value people like you do. In your precious name.
would you join with me in standing as we close? You know this song. Would you sing it together? I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your May the Lord help each one of us this week to demonstrate our value in people by investing our time in them, by investing our energy in them, and also by investing our money in them. For he who gives to the poor lends to the Lord, and the Lord will repay you. Would you raise your hands towards heaven? Father, I bless your people in the name of Jesus. I bless them as they go to work on Monday morning or whenever their work days are. I bless them as they're at home, for there are those who are working in the home. I bless those who are retired today. I bless those that are in challenging seasons of their lives. And I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that each heart will be encouraged and not discouraged by the circumstances that they are facing. I bless them that they will experience joy unspeakable this week. And that that joy will not only be their strength, but that it will bless and touch others around them. That their countenance will be contagious. And that they will encourage others to be filled with joy as well. Holy Spirit, may out of each of your people flow rivers of living water. And may lives who are today in darkness and turmoil and distress be transformed by the wonderful power of the blood of Jesus Christ. I pray, Holy Spirit, that none of us will be limited to containing you in this room, but rather that we will walk with you daily wherever we are. And may your word always be at the forefront of each and every heart. May each one be blessed for the glory of God. In the wonderful name of Jesus, amen and amen. God bless all of you. Tonight we will be meeting for prayer at 6 o'clock. You are welcome. I look forward to seeing you tonight. And may you have a blessed week in the presence of the Lord.